welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll learn to solve coupled ordinary differential equations using matrices. This is one place where your studies of linear algebra, that is eigenvalues and eigenvectors, overlaps with our story about differential equations. This is a very general technique, but we will focus on the particular example of solving coupled linear oscillators. The set of coupled linear differential equations we're going to study has the form x double dot plus ax plus by equals zero and y double dot plus cx plus dy equals zero. We call equations like these coupled because the time evolution of the first particle depends both on its position and the position of the second particle. And the same is true for the second particle. Equations of this form are also called linear because the terms that involve x or y appear at most to first order. That means that the terms are some constant a, b, c, d times either x or y. We can turn this into something that looks like a matrix equation. The time derivative acts on a vector made up of our two variables x and y. And we have a matrix of coefficients m equals a, b, C, D, that also acts on the same vector. Let me call this column vector x, y, r, so that my equation of motion becomes r double dot plus the matrix M acting on r equals zero. Like we did before, let's combine the d squared by dt squared and M matrix together into a single differential operator that acts on r. So our differential operator then is d squared by dt squared plus m, which we're going to call d. Now let's learn to solve the equation dr equals zero. This looks like a matrix equation from linear algebra. A matrix times a vector equals zero. And just like in linear algebra problems, we'll solve this by diagonalizing the operator d. This means that there is some linear combination of x's and y's, we'll call that v, that solves the equation d squared by dt squared plus lambda squared acting on v equals zero, where lambda is a constant. In fact, there are two such linear combinations. The lambdas are the eigenvalues for our operator and the v's are our eigenvectors. Here I've written v as a vector, v1 and v2, where v1 and v2 are the eigenvectors. Each of the v's are linear superpositions of the x's and y's. Or equivalently, I can invert that, and x's and y's are superpositions of the eigenvectors v1 and v2. This is exactly the same thing you've done over and over before when you solve a problem in quantum mechanics. The equation h psi equals e psi is exactly the same thing we've just done. The Hamiltonian is a linear differential operator that's acting on a set of eigenfunctions psi. When psi is the basis set for the Hamiltonian, then the energy spectrum E is just the set of eigenvalues of the system. Does any quantum state I see, or in fact any solution to one of these coupled linear systems is just a linear superposition of the eigenfunctions of that operator. The example system that we will look at here is a set of coupled simple harmonic oscillators. Imagine I have two beads, mass M1 and M2, that are connected with a set of springs. K1 goes from the wall to mass M1, K2 goes from mass M1 to M2, and K3 goes from mass M2 to a different wall. Let's write down some coordinates to describe the motion of each of the two beads. x1 will describe the motion of mass m1 away from equilibrium, and x2 will describe the motion of mass 2. So what are the forces acting on each of the beads? Mass 1 has forces acting on it coming from springs k1 and k2. In terms of the coordinates x1 and x2, the force coming from spring k1 is minus k1 times x1. For spring K2, I want to look at how much K2 is stretched away from its equilibrium length. And so that distance is going to be X1 minus X2. That gives me a force that looks like minus K2 times X1 minus X2. So let's pull out all of the X1 and X2 terms together. Then the force acting on the first mass is minus K1 plus K2 times X1 plus K2 times X2. 
and I'll do the same thing for the other particle. So spring K2 exerts an equal and opposite force on M2 as it does on M1. So that's just going to be minus K2 times X2 minus X1. And the force from spring 3 on mass M2 is just minus K3 times X2. When I group terms, I end up with K2 times X1 minus K2 plus K3 times X2. From Newton's laws, this sum of forces acting on mass 1 equals m1 x1 double dot, and the net forces acting on mass 2 are equal to m2 x2 double dot. So let's write this down like a matrix. So the mass times acceleration part of Newton's laws can be written as the diagonal matrix m1 0 0 m2 times d squared by dt squared acting on the vector x1 x2. The right-hand side of the equation is then a coefficient matrix, so minus k1 plus k2 minus k2 minus k2 k2 plus k3 acting on the vector x1, x2. Again, I'm going to call the vector x1, x2, r, which means that if we successfully diagonalize our differential operator, we'll end up with equations that look like r double dot is equal to minus omega squared r. So this form of the equation looks just like the equation for a simple harmonic oscillator. So how do I do this? Let me first pull out a factor of m1 from the left-hand side and a factor of k1 from the right-hand side. That means that all of the terms in the matrices are now going to be dimensional. Then my equation looks like m1 times some matrix m times r double dot is equal to minus k1 times some matrix k times r. Here m is going to be 1 over m1 times m1 0 0 m2 and the matrix k is going to be given by 1 over k1 times k1 plus k2 minus k2 minus k2 k2 plus k3. I'm going to call the ratio of k1 over m1 omega 1 squared. And so the equation we're going to solve looks like this. m times r double dot is equal to minus omega 1 squared times k times r. How do we solve this? What we know is that if this were diagonalized, we'd have sinusoidal solutions, but we don't know what their frequencies would be. So a general solution for this looks like r, which is the vector x1, x2, is equal to the real part of some vector a times e to the i alpha t. And again, we're going to look at the complex form of e to the i alpha t and then take the real part at the end. So when we plug this into our equation of motion, we get minus alpha squared times the matrix m plus omega 1 squared times the matrix k is equal to the vector a times e to the i alpha t equals zero. Right now, the a e to the i alpha t terms can be divided out and we're left over with a matrix of constant coefficients that we want to solve for alpha squared. And we can do this by diagonalizing this matrix. So to diagonalize this matrix, we want to solve the equation, the determinant of minus alpha squared m plus omega 1 squared k equals 0. This equation is going to give us two solutions for alpha, one positive and one negative, and these are going to be the eigenvalues of our system. For each eigenvalue, we have a corresponding eigenvector. For the positive eigenvector, we're going to solve minus alpha plus squared m plus omega 1 squared k acting on the vector a plus is equal to zero where a plus is the positive eigenvector. And likewise, we'll solve the equation minus alpha minus squared m plus omega 1 squared k acting on alpha minus is equal to zero for the negative eigenvector a minus. So this gives us two solutions to our second order equation. The full solution is going to be a linear combination of these. So it's going to be some constant c plus times the vector a plus cosine alpha plus t plus phi plus plus the constant c minus times the vector a minus times cosine alpha minus t plus phi minus. This is a second ordered set of coupled equations in two variables. So that means we need four initial conditions to specify things, and there are four corresponding unknowns in this equation. So those are going to be the constant c plus and phi plus, c minus and phi minus. In the next video, we'll look at some dynamical systems. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.